Well, good evening. It's great to see this uh, turnout this evening. I'm Andrew Petter, president of Simon Fraser University, and let me start by acknowledging the Musqueam, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples on whose traditional territories we are privileged to live, work, and play, and hear great lectures. Uh, I'm delighted, delighted to welcome you to the President's Faculty Lecture Series for this academic year. Uh, the purpose of this lecture series is really to allow us to explore some big ideas uh, by hearing from some of our outstanding faculty members. And as you may know, SFU has made it our mission to be Canada's engaged university, and part of that commitment is to share with the community some of the ideas, some of the thoughts, some of the stimulating research and discoveries of some of our faculty, and to give you a chance not only to hear from them, but also to ask questions and to consider what they have to say. Um, there will be a chance to raise questions and offer comments after the lecture, and there'll be a modest reception afterwards, these being tight fiscal times for universities, but a chance to stay back and have some coffee and cookies and to talk amongst yourselves, and hopefully our speaker will have a few minutes to spend and, and, uh, and, and converse as well in a less formal way. I will just warn you, if you do ask questions, the lecture is going to be filmed so it can be available on our YouTube channel so we can engage that way as well. So if you ask a question, you may end up on YouTube. Whether that's a plus or a minus, you'll have to decide. Uh, so let me introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Stephanie Simmons is a professor of physics at Simon Fraser University and Canada Research Chair in Quantum Nanoelectronics. She joined SFU in 2015, so she's pretty recent to SFU, but she's already made quite a mark. And let me tell you about her academic background. She earned an undergraduate double degree in pure mathematics and mathematical physics at the University of Waterloo. She earned a PhD in material science at Oxford University in 2011 as a Clarendon Scholar, and then she stayed on at Oxford with a Glassstone Research Fellowship and a Junior Research Fellowship at St. John's College. Uh, in 2014, she took up a joint position in the University of New South Wales Electrical Engineering Department and the Australian Centre of Excellence for Quantum Computation and Communication Technologies in Sydney, Australia, so quite the world traveller. Um, but we were very fortunate to be able to lure her here to Vancouver and to Simon Fraser University, and she's been with us now for a year. She's currently working on silicon-based spin qubits, with a particular aim to develop CMOS-compatible, scalable quantum technology solutions. Now, I have no idea what that all means, but I'm glad that she's here to explain it to, to me and to you. But I do know this. I do know that her team holds the quantum state world record. I know that her work on silicon cubics was awarded a Physics World Top 10 Breakthrough of the Year Award in 2013 and again in 2015. And I know she's published in, Nature, in the Nature family of journals, Science, the Physical Review family of journals, and her work has been covered by the New York Times, uh, CBC, BBC, Scientific American, and others. So please join with me in providing a very warm welcome to Dr. Stephanie Simmons. Stephanie. Thank you all very much for coming. Is the speaker on? Everything, everyone can hear me okay at the back? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for coming to this lecture tonight. I hope to be able to convince you that quantum technologies are going to change the world, but you probably haven't heard it from me first. If you're on the internet, you've probably come across crazy things that they say that quantum, just put the word quantum in front of it and suddenly it's magical. Right? You get this incredible hype, so you get some incredible sorts of um, things that you read online. So, okay, future of security, unhackable data with quantum key distribution, okay. Apparently, if you want a better battery, you put the word quantum in front of it. <laughs> and, and the next one's my favorite, actually. <laughs> and this isn't a legitimate, well, somewhat legitimate, News, news outlet, right? So you see these like crazy things online and you, you'd be really, it'd be, it'd be understandable if you think that quantum is somehow magical, it could, it could change everything, but yet you could also take a look at this and be rather skeptical, like how much should you trust this? Where is the hype? How much of that is legitimate and how much of that is true? Because alongside all these sorts of, all these sorts of headlines you see online, you also get headlines that look like this 
where you have very serious players putting in lots of money into quantum computing. And so IBM has something in it, Google has stuff in it, Microsoft, Intel, they all, all these big players are putting in lots of money towards quantum computing. So the truth has to let, lie somewhere in between, right? There's, there must be too much hype, okay, that's probably not all accurate, but there is some significant power to quantum technologies. And so the goal of this lecture, if I give you any bit of information, is a little bit of insight into what quantum technologies ought to be able to accomplish and why. And I'm gonna do it without any equations. I'm going to do it. Okay. So what happens is when you read these articles, the way that they usually explain why quantum tech is going to be so amazing, especially quantum computing, is because of this principle called the superposition principle. So how many people have heard about Schrodinger's cat? Okay, some of you, most of you. So Schrodinger's cat is this picture where a cat can be simultaneously alive and dead at the same time. So it's a little bit of a mean visual to work with. But actually, this is exactly what happens at, in, in certain environmental limits. So in the very small or at the very cold, you can have things occupying two um, completely distinct states simultaneously. So in the context of a bit, which is normally zero or one, a qubit or a quantum bit is zero and one at the same time. So this is the principle of superposition. And you'd think, just naively, okay, that's a huge amount of parallelism, right? If you, can, if you can not just process like a zero or a zero zero or a zero one, you can process them both at the same time. That seems like you can get massive computational power. But that's, it's not just that. Because there's a counterpoint to this, as with Schrodinger's box, if you open the box, the cat either is dead or alive. It snaps to one of these two states. So in the context of information processing for computing, for example, if you, if you take a look at your bit, your zero or your one, you do some computing, and then you have some answer, it's zero and one at the same time, you measure it, you get a random result. That's worse than what you would get, right? Than just a classical system. If you just get some random result, some random assembly, it's, it's not really helpful. So there's two things to it that give rise to lots of computing power, but only in certain cases. So I'm gonna explain to you kind of where, where those cases lie. So the idea is that you have to rely upon two things. It's not just superposition, i.e. you can have two configurations that exist simultaneously, which is true, you see it all the time at the quantum, on the quantum scale. But you also have this effect called interference. And so I'm gonna introduce to you a little bit of science. I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of science so you can see superposition and interference working together and then I'll map that to how you can use that for faster algorithms in certain cases. So we're gonna work with what's called the double slit experiment. So the picture is you have some light source over here. It spits out photons. So all these little particles of light going in every direction. And then you have a wall with two apertures. And then you have the screen at the end. Okay, so if you have these photons, these particles, they'll go through, you would think naively, they would go through one or the other, and you would end up with probably two blobs on either side, right? This is kind of the naive picture. How many people think this is true? <laughs> How many people think I wouldn't ask the question if it was true? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do the experiment. I have, I have actually these two apertures, right? They're very tiny, they're really close to one another. They're just in a screen right here. And I'm gonna take my laser pointer and this laser pointer here, and I'm gonna point it right over there. Okay, so it's gonna go through the screen. And this, the rest of the apparatus is just to steady my hand because I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfectly fixed here. So, here we go. Can you see that, all the dots? That's your interference pattern. You don't see two blobs, you saw a whole bunch of them. There was just two apertures right there. You can come up and take a look at it later. They're pretty close to one another. But there, there's a live quantum experiment for you right there. Um, what you get, you get these bands. Right, do you see these bands? So you get these kinds of fringe patterns, and when there's lots of photons, they're very bright. But when you turn down the light, when you only put a few photons on at once, you start getting these dots. You see how they're actually collecting just as dots? So you still know that they're particles, because they're clicking in a specific spot, but they're forming this kind of weird pattern. Okay, it's not actually that weird a pattern. Imagine you're four and this is a pool, and you're just making splashes over here. What you get from, a, if you're making splashes over here, you would get different, ap the apertures here would actually, hello, the apertures here, it's not working for some reason. So you get these bands, 
the apertures here would actually give you um, this kind of wave pattern, right? So if this is a pool and you have a bunch of different waves that are forming, um, you get interference because you can get the different crests and troughs lining up together. So for example, say you have your waves, right? If you're making splashes here, you get points where you get the, 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 the peak of one wave is always with the trough of the other one formed from the two different apertures. So you actually get cancellation where you get dark spots and bright spots where they all add up. So we have some wave thing happening, we have some particle thing happening, and that's what's happening with photons. So let's try and figure out how this maps to something we can use for computing. We're gonna go digital, all right? So we're gonna go and just take a look at these two possible outcomes, and we're gonna restrict the path of our photons so that they have to go through these apertures and they have to end up in one of these two spots. So we know that it should probably be bright here and dark here. Let me explain why. So we have a photon. It, we know that it travels like a wave even when there's only one at a time. That's what those dots meant, right? Every single one traveling travels like a wave. So it interferes with itself. It's in both of these places at once. And here what I've drawn here is like a squiggle, as you can see, squiggle, where here, all the color here is representing what's called the phase. So the phase is kind of just like the clock hand, right? It goes round and round and round and round and round. And so here I've indicated it going around the color wheel. So the phase is accumulating as the photon travels, okay? So the important point is, yes, this photon is in two places at once, but the phase agrees here. They're both red, all right? Now, let's consider the case where it hits this bright spot here. In that instance, the phase traveled agrees at the end. So you get what's called constructive interference. And so the probability of it forming a spot there is really high. In contrast, if you take a look at how the paths look when you're looking at this point at the end, you see the phase dif is different here because you have different amounts of phase accumulated on these two paths. So you get what's called destructive interference. So that's the full science lesson. Now we're going to make a computer, okay? So this is our science lesson. We know that we have constructive interference at the top and destructive interference at the bottom. Okay, so let's go back to the constructive interference case. I'm gonna introduce an operation to you called a phase shifter. So a phase shifter, I'm just gonna draw it with a diagram like this. But what it means is anything that travels through this aperture has its phase flipped 180 degrees. So here, the phase would be flipped. But you'll see now that the outcomes have changed. Right? So what used to be constructive interference is now destructive and vice versa. Now, but this would be the case for a single photon, right? This all is still the way that you would describe how a single photon propagates. So that means if you put a detector right here and right here, depending upon which detector clicks, that tells you whether or not there was a phase shifter here, right? So we actually have a way of figuring out whether or not there is a phase shifter object here with a single photon. Now, for a classical system, like we're kind of, I like calling us classical. Classical physics, I mean like Newtonian physics, right? From a classical computer, i.e. computers that rely upon the laws of classical physics like this, this is a classical computer. Um, if they had to compute this, you would have to go through and check one and then the other, right? So you actually already see a little bit of a quantum speed up here because you can check the answer to this, provided you don't lose any photons and all this other stuff. You can check it by just measuring which, which um, place it ended up at the end. All right, so you have that information, but you actually have a little bit more. You have the case where you have no phase shifters. We take a look at that spot. It was a bright spot. And we took a look at the case if we have a single phase shifter and it ended up being destructive interference at that same location. But you have other two cases just as well, right? Say you had a phase shifter in the other port, you would also get destructive interference here because the phases don't line up. But if you had a phase shifter in both of them, the phases will still agree. There'll be a different phase, but they'll agree. So actually what you've answered, the question that you've answered with a single photon is, are there an even or an odd number of phase shifters here? So with a single photon, you've answered this, this broader question. Okay, so that doesn't seem like, in this example, it doesn't seem like a huge quantum speed up as it is, right? So this is a rather limited case. 
but let's consider a generalization. All right? It's a rather contrived generalization, but nevertheless, it kind of shows you where this speed up can happen. So suppose you're given a data set, and you are told that it's either completely balanced, which means there is the same number of zeros as there are ones, or that it's completely identical, i.e. it's all zeros or all ones. For a classical computer to try and answer the question whether or not it's balanced or identical, for the top case, you would see a zero and then you see a one and then you'd be done. You're like, okay, it has to be a balanced data set. However, if you're checking the bottom, you would actually have to check through half plus one to be absolutely certain that for all the zeros that you find here, that the rest aren't a bunch of ones, right? So you actually have to go through most, a majority of the data set to be certain that it's a fully identical list of, list of numbers. But in the quantum case, we can set this up as a superposition and interference problem, right? So you can set it up where you're taking a look at a superposition of all of these different paths, for example, where some of them correspond to phase shifters. And in this instance, you get a perfectly destructive interference, right? All the phase shifts from the ones would cancel out all of the uh, unphase shifted zero ports. So in this instance, when everything's balanced, everything would constructively interfere. So here with a single photon, you've actually determined whether or not it's balanced or identical because you're making use of the fact that not only can these, these objects can be in a superposition of lots of di different configurations simultaneously, but that they interfere back to a deterministic yes or no answer at the end. So this is the kind of spooky, weird thing um, which gives rise to exponential power for, quantum, for certain quantum algorithms. But because we don't yet have a full understanding of all the possible ways you can interfere different, different superpositions, we don't have a list of all the possible algorithms you can use to get a quantum boost, let's say. So I should say that there's a lot of details, a lot of important details that I'm sweeping, sweeping under the rug with this kind of presentation. But it nevertheless gives you the flavor for why quantum computers will be very powerful. You can have not only a superposition of all these different configurations, but that you can use interference to get deterministic answers at the end. And that's that part that a lot of people seem to miss out. Okay, so I said the word exponential speed up, and I want you to know what I mean when I say that. So for a lot of problems, not all problems, but for a lot of problems that computers are used to solve, things get really difficult really fast. So there's a lot of problems like chemical simulations or material simulations, or actually the hard problem of like cryptography and breaking codes. It gets really difficult the bigger the problem is, right? The bigger the molecule or the bigger whatever. Things blow up. And so what you'll say, I'll call those classical algorithms, i.e. they're algorithms that are using classical computing hardware. Now some of them, this Netflix doesn't count in this, right? We're not talking about video games. We're talking about you know, certain really tough problems that modern computers just can't solve and what most of the supercomputing farms are using all their time towards uh, these kinds of problems or a lot of these kinds of problems. Whereas for some problems, you can get quantum solutions that actually don't scale nearly so badly. That doesn't mean that they're faster at the start. In fact, most of the quantum processors that we work with are really slow. But the point is, is that for a certain problem size, you wouldn't try this using a classical system. For some problems, you would have, you know, if this goes to a certain problem size, this would actually go beyond the age of the universe if you wanted to compute it fully. But if you wanted to take a look at what the quantum version would be, it would be a very manageable amount of time. So it's the scaling that gives you this quantum advantage. It's not necessarily going to be in the small side that you see this advantage. It's going to be as it gets larger and larger do you see these sorts of scaling advantages. So when we say exponential speed up, it means it's the difference between the classical, the cost of a classical computation versus the cost of a quantum computation. Okay, so what problems? What problems are quantum computers good at? Right? I've told you that you need superposition and interference to even have a hope of having a quantum speed up. Um, but this kind of can give you a sense of the sorts of problems where we have found some solutions that have a quantum speed up, a quantum exponential speed up in some instances. 
This is not a comprehensive list. This is just trying to give you a flavor for the sorts of problems that quantum should be able to attack or has a hope of trying to attack. Um, so for holistic properties like the identical balance case, that's a holistic property of some larger data set where you can use superposition and then interfere it back to get a, a property of this larger data set. So things that fit there, what's the ground state of some sort of chemical um, interaction, some chemical simulations, uh, how they form configurations. There's a lot of big data and machine learning algorithms that have some quantum speed up associated with them. Not all of them, right? Of course, not all molecular dynamics and machine learning algorithms have a quantum speed up that we know of. But again, the algorithms that we've found so far, the algorithms that people have thought of when they don't even have a physical hardware to, to implement it on. Right? We're, talking about, um, we're talking about things that have, people have been working on for decades without having any fully-fledged universal processor to actually develop. So as soon as we get people actually building these things with live machines, fully scaled up machines, we might expect a lot more findings. Um, but yeah, optimization and forecasting fit within this, this realm as well. You can also rephrase finding needle in a haystack problems as, these, as ones that quantum um, processors have a hope of attacking exponentially faster than classical systems. Um, some of these examples, including searching, this one's only a quadratic speed up rather than exponential, but because we search unsorted data a lot of the time, this has huge advantages. Um, and this is the one that's kind of been funding um, this for the past couple decades. Um, RSA encryption is what's used um, for the hard, hardcore encryption over the internet, for example. Um, and RSA encryption works because it's difficult to find the prime factors of a big number if there's only two prime factors. So it's what's known as a computationally asymmetric problem. If I hand you one of the two primes, you can just divide the big number by that prime and know what the other prime is. But if you don't have one of any of those two primes, it's very difficult to go through and find what those constituent primes are. You have to kind of go through a lot of them manually. It's a bit better than that, but it's still really difficult. That is what is used right now to encode a lot of people's uh, data, right? HTTPS, um, a lot of, or, or more, more heavy duty encryption techniques are using what's known as RSA. And quantum computers have a really ex an exponentially efficient way of cracking RSA. So the NSA is investing and lots of other, you know, defense agencies are investing. And when I say this to people, the first question they ask is, why are you trying to break the internet? Um, and that's a legitimate question, um, which I'll turn to in a couple slides, because fortunately, quantum technologies also offer a bit of a saving grace in, this, in the encryption side of things. But the second question that people typically ask me when I go through this like, ex kind of um, candidate list of algorithms that can be solved more efficiently using quantum technologies, they're like, well, why haven't you built one yet? You know, if, all, if you have all these advantages, why, why haven't you gotten around to it yet? What's keeping you? Okay, well, if I were to answer that question honestly, it all comes down to this. There's an object, we'll call, it a, we'll call it a quantum cloner. The basic principle of this black box operation would be if you had an input qubit and some blank kind of vanilla qubit that you can use as kind of a resource, a quantum cloner box would just basically photocopy that qubit for you. Okay, so it's a really simple operation. But in quantum mechanics, this is forbidden. It's not even like a little forbidden, it's properly forbidden. There's no way you can get around this. This thing cannot exist. You cannot clone quantum data. You can't photocopy quantum data. This has lots of implications and it's the reason why we haven't built a quantum computer yet because this throws a huge wrench in the works. But it has some positive side effects as well. So let's bring it back to the discussion about encryption. Say we had a message that we wanted to keep super secret. If you wanted that to be absolutely secret, what you could do is you could encode that information, or rather, you can have, you can send super um, qubits in superposition. Now, when you measure a qubit, remember, it was always going to snap to one of those values, right? It was never, a, if you measure it, if you look at it, it never holds onto that superposition anymore. It snaps to something, some other value. 
that changes the, if you set up your superposition correctly, that can change the statistics of what's seen at the receiver end. So you can actually see if somebody has been interfering and in measuring the um, quantum super, the data that's contained in the quantum superposition. You, generally, you do it a little bit differently, but that's the basic premise. Now, because you can't clone quantum data, any eavesdropper who wanted to listen in on it can't just copy the quantum bits and then measure it themselves later, right? So by having no quantum cloning available, it means that they have to look at the message directly and then that would change the statistics and then you could see it at the end, the receiver end. So there are ways of setting up unhackable secure encryption using what's known as quantum key distribution. So that first, that first title that I gave you at the start of the lecture is actually a true one. You can get unhackable encryption. And what's really nice about this is that that's not a computational thing. Right? It's, not, it's not the difficulty of finding prime factors or anything like that. This is a physical principle to do with the laws of quantum mechanics. So it's a, me it's a mechanical encryption rather than a, a computational one. And so it can be provably secure if you, if you take care of certain cases. So that's really encouraging. And you can buy those systems now, which is kind of incredible. They don't go very far because you have to use photons and photons get lost. Um, but people are working at trying to get them to larger and larger networks of of secure encryption, of quantum secure encryption. So anyway, we, have, we now have encryption back on our side, so this is great. Um, but what does this mean for quantum computers? Well, the reason why quantum cloning would be great for computing purposes is because error correction is a big deal. If you're actually working with a physical system, and like if you're working with a classical system, you have redundancy all over the place. Right? And it, what happens is most of the time for just basic error correction, what you would do for whatever data you want to store, you copy it, say, into three different states, three different bits, and then it's encoded across all three of them. And then if some error happens, what you do is you just compare each, each of them, and you do basically do a majority votes on what's left over. Right? So if you have three bits and one gets corrupted, then you just do a majority votes, and then you'll still get the correct result at the end. So that's how kind of rudimentary error correction works for at least normal computers or classical computers, but we can't do this step. This step has proven incredibly difficult because we can't clone, we can't just copy that information. So the entire, the whole reason why we don't yet have a quantum computer, a full universal quantum computer, is because error correction is incredibly hard using quantum systems. So we can't use the way that it's done classically, but fortunately, about mm, 14 years ago or so, maybe a bit longer now, they figured out a quantum version of it. So it's called quantum error correction, but it is really, really hard. And so the entire race for the past, say, 20 years for people trying to build a quantum processor to try and do all these fantastic exponential speed up computations and simulate chemicals and, and help, help for material de um, delivery, all that sort of stuff has come down to, well, can we even attempt to do quantum error correction? Because if we can't do quantum error correction, there's no hope trying to build a computer. So it's been this massive gap between where theory was, when theory first came out with what you, could, what you needed, what accuracy you needed to actually perform quantum error correction, it was in the parts per million range. That means every single operation has to be perfect except for one in a million, roughly. That's incredibly challenging with these, these rather delicate quantum systems, right? So back there in 1995 was kind of when things kind of got started in the hardware development for quantum systems. And experiments, I would, I'm just going to list a few of them. I'm not going to list all of them. I'm just going to use a subset. Um, the experiment started off with an error rate around, say, 10%. So this is a logarithmic scale, right? This is a huge gap between where the theorists said we needed to be and where the experimentalists were. Um, these people were very brave, very, very brave. And it's, this is like a threshold number, which means that until you hit this error rate, everything beyond that's useless. You make it worse rather than making it better. So you have to try and cross these two, and that's what's been happening over the past 20 years. People have just been pushing this. Now, fortunately, rather early on, they figured out that if you could, instead of having a few really, really perfect qubits, you can have many more kind of perfect qubits. You can get away from this issue. So here that means that, okay, yeah, we could tolerate a much higher error rate, but that means we need to have thousands more qubits, thousands of actual physical qubits to represent one logical qubit. So at the cost of having maybe a thousand times more qubits than necessary for each one actual logical qubit, 
um, we could possibly get away with this kind of error rate. So the experimentalists are like, yeah, sure, this is great. Let's go, let's go for that one. Let's just build thousands of these things. Okay, you can kind of tell how well that's going, right? Okay, so, but there has been a lot of progress. So there have been theoretical developments, and this is all just kind of heuristic, right? So you just have to be a little bit generous with how I'm labeling all of this. Um, but on ion traps, ion traps have been pushing the mark. Um, and then on two, in 2005, we had another, um, we had a, some break on the scene, which was superconductors. You know, arguably, maybe around 2005, maybe a bit earlier. Um, superconducting qubits are fantastic because they're, they're currents of, um, they're superpositions of current in, in uh, material that has zero resistance. So you have to be at really, really cold temperatures and then your zero is a current flowing one way and then your one is a current flowing the other way. So you have a superposition of like the direction of current. It's really cool stuff. Anyway, so they started in 2005. They've been pushing the mark to, um, they were moving forward. And then in 2009, silicon came on the map. And I'm mentioning silicon because I work on silicon. Also because I think it's going to win. Um, okay, so 2009, things are running around. Um, error rates are getting a lot better. Already, ion traps are quite close to what you need for, for error correction. 2013, lots of movement. Things are really accelerating. In 2015, superconductors also made a move. And that was my contribution while I was in Sydney. So we're now, we're now, all three of these, as well as a couple other systems, but mainly, mainly these ones, are basically at this, at this threshold. Now is the time where you can start assembling these things into actual full-scale technologies. Before you hit those kinds of numbers, it, wasn't, it didn't make any sense because the basic ingredients weren't good enough. Okay, so why am I on silicon? Why do I work with silicon beyond, okay, iron traps are winning, they're oldest, why am I working on silicon? Well, if you remember, this threshold came at a cost. You have to have like millions to billions of perfect, near perfect qubits all working together. And if you want to think of what humanity has done, what we've been able to make billions of that are basically perfect, the best example is CMOS electronics. So all the transistors in the chips in your phone and your computers, there's like billions of them. And they have a failure rate of about one in a billion. Now, of course, that doesn't directly map to the kind of error rate here, but it kind of sh it shows you that you can make billions of near-perfect nanoscale objects and get them to work on a systematic level. And so I'm inspired by the fact that we can harness, hopefully, harness this entire semiconductor industry to build, say, a quantum coprocessor or something like that. So that's my motivation for working on silicon qubits. Okay, so what do they look like? So at the moment, the Sydney guys, um, their devices, their quantum devices look something like this. So that's silicon, there's a bunch of aluminum on top, and then the qubit is right in the center bit here, and this is all like control, it's all basically for control and readout. But the qubit itself is a single atom implanted into the silicon right at that, right at that spot. So a single atom being controlled by all this hardware, but this is still like relatively small. This goes into the bottom of a big fridge, what we call a fridge. It's a dilution refrigerator. We just call it a fridge. This is something that keeps, this is a D-Wave picture because they also use dilution refrigerators. Um, so they have their system at the bottom. Our UNSW system was basically the exact same kind of construction. Everything kept really, really cold temperatures So because that's where you get the best kinds of quantum properties. Now, People will ask me whether or not D-Wave is a quantum computer because there's this controversy. It is. It is a real quantum computer, but it's not a universal quantum computer. So a universal quantum computer can put arbitrary superpositions and then get arbitrary interference subject to the laws of quantum mechanics. D-Wave has a restricted set that they can explore. It still could be useful for a lot of algorithms, but it's not a universal one. So there's, there's the controversy resolved for you. Um, so they're doing absolutely excellent stuff. Um, but of course, this isn't the first time you've had a computer take the size of the room, right? If you go back and take a look at the 40s, and there are very early computer scientists here, um, it was the size of a room. And you would spend that, you would definitely work with that if that gave you computational power that you didn't otherwise have, all right? So I'm not worried that it's the size of a room and requires all this weird cooling. It's, if you can get exponential speed up, if, you can, if that can let you simulate drug interactions, and what that could do for the pharmaceutical industry, for example, I think it's absolutely worth it. Okay, so where are we in the race? There's a race, I showed you kind of where things are from an error perspective. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what our qubits actually are. There's one slide, this is my one slide about my research, okay? So very high level, so don't worry too much. 
So we have a silicon crystal. This is silicon over here. Um, if you replace one of the silicon atoms with one of, say, these, these particular atoms, so phosphorus or arsenic, you'll have a situation that looks like this. So this is just some small section of the silicon lattice. You have one atom replacing one of those silicon atoms. And what you get when you do that is you get an electron spin and a nuclear spin. And so a spin can really be thought of like a small bar magnet. So our zero is, say, like north-south, and our one is our south-north. Okay, so we're in a superposition of the orientation of this little bar magnet. Those are, that's our zero and our one. That's our qubit. And we have two qubits. We have an electron spin qubit and a nuclear spin qubit. And if you implant that into the silicon, you get the qubit. Okay, so that's kind of nice because then you can work with regular silicon electronics around it. Now, everybody else, including the Australians, are working on, on these particular atomic defects. So this is a defect, right? It's replacing. It's not perfect. It's a defect. Um, it's, the Australians are working on this as well as the other people in the world that are working on silicon spin qubits. The people up at SFU, the team, we are now working primarily on these particular um, atomic defects. But these ones, the reason why we're going for these ones is because they have a very nice feature. They interact with light. They interact with photons in a very convenient way. So our big, our big idea, our big scheme to try and build a quantum computer is actually to use light and spin qubits together. So we have these spin qubits where we implant into the silicon, and you can have photon qubits that, in, that mediate these interactions. And so this will be one way that we can assemble larger and larger networks of qubits and for hopefully, hopefully form a full-scale um, silicon-based quantum computer. So that's our big idea. Nobody else in the world is doing this yet, but we only just announced it a few months ago, so we'll see how things go. Um, so that's our big idea. Where are we in the race? Well, as I said, there's a, you have to care very much about error rates, but the big breakthrough in 2013 from Simon Fraser was on a different metric. So this is a graph where I just compiled a whole bunch of different publications. These are a bunch of different publications within the quantum tech community. And this scale here is how long a qubit lives. So actually qubits in their superposition, they don't live like that forever. They get corrupted by the environment eventually. And so superconducting qubits are down here, right? They're this orange bit. They're mainly down here. Um, whereas the silicon spin qubits are all the way up here. So they're very, very long-lived. And in fact, this was this breakthrough, the top 10 physics world top 10 breakthrough of the year result, led by Mike Thiewald, who's in the audience. And I got to participate on that, which was, which was a lot of fun. Um, so what's important? Why does this lifetime matter? Well, when you're thinking about doing a computation, there will be lots of time where, where you're just kind of holding and you're just waiting. The, the do nothing operation, right? But the do nothing operation, if, it cor if it's slowly corrupted over time, that amounts to an error rate. So basically, what you're measuring here, what you're plotting here, is the effective error rate per operation time. So you have to kind of be in this top half of the graph to even have a hope of building, building something that's um, suitable for quantum error correction. And that's the whole name of the game. It's all just trying to get error correction standards. So that's where we are on the race. Not only is the semiconductor industry backing us up, and we hopefully can make use of all the same nanofabrication techniques that are used for CMOS uh, transistors, we also have some of the best ingredients out there. Like the basic quantum ingredients are almost unparalleled. So that's why we're really excited about this approach, and, and hopefully we can make technology out of it. So here is just kind of my summary slide on universal-based quantum computers. This is me saying this, so I'm not, like, everybody in the, in the um, field will probably have a slightly different graph. Um, but I'm giving you, I figure it would be useful to, for you to know kind of where I think the current state of affairs is. So, at the moment, I would say openly that superconductors are in the lead. Um, this is because they have this one check mark. They know how to connect qubits really easily. None of these other systems have that. And that's the reason why they've been racing ahead. That's why Google's put in a lot of money. Um, that's why D-Wave probably went with this architecture, um, with the superconducting-based architecture. Um, that's why IBM's doing superconducting qubits, and there's a couple startups in superconducting qubits as well. But the bare ingredients aren't nearly as good as silicon qubits. What's been missing with silicon spin qubits is how do you get them to link to one another? And so this linking them with photon qubits hopefully is going to address both of those check marks, and then we're going to launch to the front. But we're not there at the moment. If I'm honest with you, we're probably in second, maybe third. We're kind of tied with iron traps. 
Iron traps also, the ingredients are very, very good. The basic quantum ingredients are fantastic, um, but they're also having scaling issues. And they're also trying to, they're going to also try to use photons to link them in kind of a similar way to the way that we are. So I wish them all the best. Um, photons are fantastic qubits, but they get lost all the time, all the time. So they really benefit most when they have some sort of um, matter-based equivalent that they can work with. So in our case, that's an electron spin or a nuclear spin. So that's where I think the field is at the moment. This will change like month to month. Things are really moving fast and it's a very exciting time um, to participate in this field. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Wow, that was a quantum journey. Yeah. And now we take a quantum leap to uh, invite you to uh, pose any questions or comments you have. We have a couple of microphones that will soon be out there. And uh, we'll try to take questions for the next uh, 20 minutes or so before we, uh, we have a reception. So who wants to ask the first question? There are no such things as stupid questions. <laughs> And I won't answer because there are such things as stupid answers, but Stephanie won't give any of those. Right over here then. Can you just possibly uh, touch on what the uh, 4K was in the chart? Oh, sure. So this is, a, this is a, a personal thing that I think is very important, but it's not as crucial as the other ones, so you're right to flag it. So um, this is a measure of temperature. So Kelvin is the, the unit of temperature near absolute zero that's preferred. Well, it's the unit of temperature for everywhere, but People that work with cryogenics use Kelvin. So that means four Kelvin. Four Kelvin is um, where helium boils. So helium is the only thing that doesn't freeze as you go to a sufficiently cold temperature, which is the re it powers kind of this whole cryogenics dilution refrigerator technology. And in my view, um, having a 4K solution has significant advantages. If you're trying to build a physical system with billions of qubits and lots of wires and lots of control, that's a lot of heat. It's really difficult to work at ultra, ultra low temperatures, but slightly higher temperatures, i.e. 4K or higher, have lots of advantages from a, from a logistical perspective, just trying to physically make the thing. It's not a strict requirement. If this one was dropped out, it would still deter we would still have the same sort of structure for all the rest of them. But superconducting qubits are, will be forever based, well, I don't want to say forever, that's a really dangerous thing. Um, <laughs> for the moment, are restricted to millikelvin temperatures, or rather their performance is greatly Im improved at millikelvin temperatures, which is a really difficult place to work. But yet people have been able to do it. D-Wave has a lot, of, um, a lot of technology developed for getting lots of wires down to millikelvin temperatures. So they're engineering challenges rather than um, hard limits. You're really enthusiastic about this stuff. It's yeah. great. Um, find, we can find someone at the back, because uh, we have a microphone at the back, and then we'll come up to the front here. Um, if you could stand up, that would be helpful so we can uh, see. Physically, classical computers, zeros and ones, it's two-dimensional. If I'm saving something on my hard drive, a flash drive, are you describing something that's actually three-dimensional, light? It's, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I couldn't go through, I promised that I wouldn't give equations, so I didn't go into the full picture. But the, the analogy is much more than just moving from 1D to 2D to 3D. The way to think about it from a visual perspective, and this, won't, this might not make much sense, but if you want to imagine the zero and the one, in a classical bit, as the north and south pole, the, the kinds of quantum states you can have are all the possible other places on the globe, as well as inside that sphere. Those are all valid quantum states. So you're going from like a discrete thing, where it's just one and zero, to having a massive amount of information that you could hold in one quantum state. But the problem is, is when you look at it, it only ever tells you a North Pole or South Pole. So it's a different way of, it's not just going to like a, a bit to a, a, a 3D version of that. That's not the way to think about it. It's a completely different way of processing information and encoding it. Okay, so someone uh, close to the front here. We'll we'll start right here. No, we need we need you to stand question, with your microphone. Question so that. Look. Is this working? Yeah. Hello. Go for it. Can you can I'm, you stand up <laughs> so people at the back can see you? Thank you. Oh, I don't want them to see me. But yeah, anyway. yeah. Well, there you go. That's the price you pay for asking. <laughs> anyway, I'm just wondering about the quantum error rate. Is that due to the readout or the programming of Where those we states? Are, right. Because I find it hard to believe that the physics of the quantum reality would be an error. 
I just would like to clarify So are you referring to how accurate we've managed to control these things, or what's no, like necessary No, like the quantum state form? is the way the quantum state should be. Sure, but, but if but I'm programming it, am I causing those those errors it's, it's by the disturbance of programming? And no, also, uh, no. Well, yeah, it's a control error. So Stephanie, that, so, can you back up and just frame the question? So I can try. <laughs> so, all right. Um, as far as I understand it, the question is, um, is how... Um, much of the error, is that an intrinsic error or is it something to do with the way we interact with the system? Um, and in almost every case, it's, well, for our case, it's how, how accurately we can control the system most of the time and, and understand the environment. Because if the environment around an individual qubit changes a little bit, it has a big, a big impact on what the characteristics of the qubit are. So you have to know them all perfectly and have them all really well under control. Some other qubits, they're, they're limited by, say, the lifetime of the qubit. And so the natural decay rate is exactly what the decay rate they would get from the lifetime of the qubit. So different, di different circumstances for different qubits. Let's go to the middle of the room here. Is there, if you can find something, right? There's a gentleman right here. We need to have a few women asking questions. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so you, you mentioned briefly uh, that you can buy a quantum encrypted network. Um, so how exactly is that information, uh, like through what medium is it, translated and do you think that in the future there will be such thing as a quantum network? Yeah, so um, the question is um, what's the medium of transmission for a quantum encrypted network and do we think that we can get a global one eventually? And uh, yeah, to answer your second point, yes, I think we can get a global one eventually. Um, at the moment what's transferring is photons. Photons are great quantum particles. Um, they go super far and they don't interact with the environment very much. If you take two flashlights you can hold them at right angles to one another and they don't, you know, you don't get any splashback or anything, right? They just keep carrying on. So they don't interact with the environment very much, but they do get lost. Um, so at the moment, quantum key distribution is using photons over fibers or over using free space. Um, but because of photon loss as a function of distance, that only has a limited, um, it has a limited length. So what you need, because you can't copy it, right? You can't copy quantum information, so you can't amplify it, right? Amplification is kind of copying it. So you can't just like boost it as it goes. So you have to come up with a quantum variant to form these larger grids, and people are working on that very hard. Uh, right back there. There we go. Please stand up. Thank you. You mentioned in the previous answer that um, the environment of the qubit can affect it, and of course it makes me think of quantum entanglement. Do, is that an issue for you? And thank you. So the question is, does quantum entanglement play a role in um, the changing environment? And absolutely, that's, that's kind of the only way that things couple. Or no, maybe that's unfair too. Um, but yeah, no, that happens frequently, where you can actually get slow exchange of, inf inter of information, making it basically an entangled state. So what I didn't mention, I didn't mention entanglement in this talk like at all. Um, entanglement is a kind, a special kind of superposition. It's a superposition that's shared across lots of different qubits, and it's very, very important. And I didn't have time to go into it, but it's something to worry about for sure. Not just with the environment, but between each of the other qubits. You want to make lots of entanglement between lots of different qubits, and that could be more fragile than just the individual superpositions. I'm going to challenge the proposition that there's no such thing as a stupid question by asking, why can't you copy it? What's the reason you can't copy it? Um, it's a mathematical proof, and I promised no equations. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. I thought it was a stupid question. No, it um, isn't. <laughs> Uh, Heather, you've got to find no, someone near the quite. front here. Right here. Right here. Hi. I'm, stand I'm, up now. Stand up. It's the, price, <laughs> the price of a question is you have to stand and show your face. I'm interested in your thoughts. You talked about um, heat and the effect that it does have on the proton. Um, is there a concern about gravity at all in your research? Oh. That's a very interesting question. So the question is, does gravity affect... Um, my research at all. And at the moment, no, other than dropping various expensive pieces of equipment from now and again. Um, so, so there are some, there's some people that think that if you have sufficiently large superpositions, you could start playing, you have to think about, and I, we're nowhere near there at the moment. Um, the, the reason why heat matters is because heat, when it's quantized, when you want to think about it as a quantum object, it's like little vibrations. Yeah. And so things vibrate and they move, those vibrations move around kind of like particles. Right. And that can, that can mess with your system. You can mess with your quantum system. So. But gravity so far hasn't really posed an issue, or at least not, I don't, not that I'm aware of. Not yet. Okay, thank you. You are so crisp with your questions and Stephanie with your answers. We have time, we're gonna have time for more <laughs> questions. So, we, so come up, if you could just find someone towards the back or towards the middle, just go for it, right there. Up, 
Stand up, thank you. I'm gonna try and trump you. <laughs> is graphene something to be considered? Is gra so the question, is graphene something to be considered? And yeah, there's like a dozen different quantum platforms out there. Um, graphene got a lot of attention because it can, it can hold, um, it can hold onto qubits. Um, so actually, if you go and take a look at, oh, sorry. Let's go back to the slide here, where I show the kind of native error rates. One of them, one of them is in carbon nanotubes. That's graphene kind of rolled up. Um, they're down here. So I'm not worried about them. Um, <laughs> at least not just yet. Um, no, okay, to be fair, there's, there's going to be lots of surprises before we end up with a full system. And although I have confidence in, in our particular approach, there's going to be, you know, it's going to be a wild ride. Who knows what's going to come up from the woodwork and have even better quantum properties and, and completely upset us. Um, I think there's lots of things to, to consider and there's still lots of fundamental research that needs to be done to get them to the state where they're competitive. Um, so at the moment I'm not worried, but of course you have to keep an eye out. Heather, you're going to have to go back a few rows so we don't leave people out in the middle area there, here, right near the right here. projector. A gentleman in a beret. I, uh, with silicon, is up, there... Up, 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 up. With, this, <laughs> with the silicon, is there hope to have a room temperature, uh, you know, with the terminal noise, like a quantum laptop with a silicon uh, chip, like uh, that's going to work with all the Wi-Fi, the radio waves <laughs> and the... Uh, Quantum the, the, the terminal noise and everything? So the question is, with, with silicon sp spin qubits, is there a hope that this could work at room temperature? And actually, I want to say yeah. So in this result here, this result corresponds to about three hours. That was taken at low temperature. But actually, the qubits themselves, the actual quantum particles, work very well at room temperature. So the title of that result, the paper where that came from, is room temperature, qubit bit storage, up to 39 minutes, or some variant of those words, right? 39 minutes at room temperature. So the qubits behave very well at room temperature. And actually other qubits, um, NVs, NVs here, they work very well at room temperature as well. The difficulty is actually figuring out a low air way of communicating and reading out, right? So at the moment, the only solution that, that many people have come up with for silicon, as well as for other systems like superconductors, involves low temperatures. But that doesn't mean that the qubits themselves misbehave down there. It's just our way of interacting with them is limited. Um, it has a temperature um, aspect to it. So maybe some clever people going forward will figure out a way to get the room temperature qubits linked up and communicating. So I have hope. It's not limited ultimately to a low temperature thing. It's just the best thing we know of right now. And if someone sort of three quarters back or two thirds back, is there someone back there who wants to ask a question? Okay, we'll come up closer here. Someone, a gentleman right here, Heather. You okay for a few minutes? Um, yeah. Ethical boundaries, is there any nation corporation that you would not work with? Can, can you phrase the question again? I didn't hear the start. Is there any nation or corporation nation with or whom corporation? you would refuse to work? Oh, geez. <laughs> um, I don't know. I haven't been approached by all of them. <laughs> uh, so it is, um, as things progress, as things progress, um, it will be a little bit like playing with fire. So there will be a lot of, um, there's a lot of defense agencies that are getting involved and a lot of defense corporations that are getting involved and the space will start to tighten up. It's not there yet, it's still academic, it's still mainly led by academic labs, um, at least the universal quantum computing side of it. Um, that is because uh, it's still a long way off in a lot of, for a lot of systems. Like, we're not talking five years, right? This is still a 20 year pro project at a minimum, really. Um, and so the funding structure, like you don't get VCs that are terribly interested in it. However, Lockheed Martin, okay, they could just throw a billion dollars at it, right? So I, to answer your question, I'm not going to answer your question, um, <laughs> because because it's going to be a crazy world. We'll so, so let me goes. try to reframe the question. If 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 I were to write a a sci-fi movie about the horrors, the future <laughs> horrors of quantum, credibly, <laughs> what would be the worst scenario that you might imagine or fear? <laughs> That so, this will unlock, what potential this unlock that could be misused in some way that will scare us all and send us home all in happy encryption, All encryption's gone, right? So, so actually, the NSA, as well as a number, of other, um, another other, a number of other agencies from a number of other countries, are recommending that we stop using RSA because data right now that's transmitted and coded using that encryption technique can be held onto, right? And, and eventually, if a quantum computer comes around, they can go back and figure out what was being said. 
So the worst thing would be, okay, NSA finally, there's like somebody, some whistleblower that says, oh, actually, yeah, they have a quantum computer. They've been reading everything for ages. <laughs> then, then that really is a, is a difficult situation because we don't yet have quantum encryption globally. We only have it locally. And so okay. there'll be a period where there's no encryption or at least one actor has the ability to read no matter how good your encryption is, which is kind of scary. Um, so fortunately, the quantum encryption, the quantum key distribution side is kind of um, winning that race. But again, it's whatever gets there first is going to be a very interesting transition period. Can I ask one more question? No, 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 no. we got to go around. You, a afterwards, you can ask us. Who else has a question somewhere back there? We have one right over here. I want, I want to go to people who haven't asked. There's a gentleman right here. Uh, what's the difference between uh, programming a classical computer and programming a quantum computer? So to repeat the question, it was what's the difference between programming a quantum computer and programming a, um, a classical computer? So at the moment, there are very, very different ways of thinking about algorithms, right? You're trying to control, you're trying to imagine ways of controlling information that's in lots of different configurations simultaneously and moving it around. So from an instinctual view, it's, it's a very different process. Um, but if you're familiar with um, linear algebra, it's actually a, an exercise in applying linear algebra. So, so the programming is done through linear algebra rather than through um, other, other modes of, of manipulating information. So at the moment, it's very difficult to say because we're playing with very small quantum systems, very small number of qubits where you can actually still think about it with a, a pretty intuitive picture. But as soon as it gets to really large scale, it becomes much more difficult to think about how you'd create algorithms that way. Um, but fortunately, we have a long way to go before we have to figure out what, say, language you want to be using for a quantum processor and how you would think about coding in that, in that framework, because there's lots of different ways of approaching it. Um, we're not really well geared to thinking in terms of quantum mechanics, right? We're, we deal with classical objects all the time. We deal with classical physics. So building that intuition, it'll take a few generations to get a really um, understandable language, just like there was an evolution in the way that we were learning to program classical systems. It became better and more natural over time. We'll take two more quick questions um, before we do our reception. There's a gentleman over here on the side. We don't want people on the side to be discriminated against. So Heather, if you can find your way over or get a microphone over to him. And if he's prepared to stand up. <laughs> Thank you. Question, doctor. How will this help us get to Mars? How will this help us get to Mars? Oh, geez. I don't... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you could apply it for. Maybe there's maybe there's better optimization that you need to go and some of that and big travel. data computation. Maybe maybe there's a big computationally intensive thing that will will benefit from quantum algorithms. That's that's quite far off. I hope we get to Mars sooner than this comes online. This will take a while. <laughs> and uh, last question, we have someone just over here, I think, or over there. Okay. Uh, just curious, has uh, deep learning artificial intelligence been applied to some of the uh, quantum uh, uh, computing problems? Can you repeat that question again? Sorry, I didn't hear you clearly. Have you used deep learning artificial intelligence uh, um, to uh, address some of the quantum computing uh, issues? All right, so the question is, have I used deep learning methods to try and um, approach these quantum computing issues? And the answer is no, but I think that that could be a really interesting um, combination of, of skills or a combination of fields um, because for example we're, we don't know all the possible quantum algorithms right now so perhaps you can use machine learning techniques to find better quantum algorithms maybe that's one way of doing it rather than the more like uh, kind of um, well-established view that there are certain deep learning techniques that or at least certain machine learning techniques that have advantages when you use quantum mechanics as part of that programming step um, so there's two sides to it. I think there's a lot of interplay there, and that could be where, what really motivates this field going forward. So it's a really excellent question. But I haven't done anything because I work with like one qubit or like two qubits. We're still trying to get the basic building block of how they talk to one another um, working uh, really reliably. So I don't need anything fancy like that yet. I know there's some others out there who have questions, and Stephanie, you're prepared to stay back for a sure. little bit for ask, answer individually. Um, what an amazing lecture. I don't know about you, but I came here thinking RSA meant the Royal Society of Art. <laughs> and um, yeah, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and, and I don't know about you, but I would have thought that qubits is what's left over if your Q-tip breaks, but <laughs> obviously I was wrong. Um,
it's, it's great to learn about new vistas and new areas, and some of you are already deeper into this than, than others, but I really want to thank Stephanie. I also want to encourage you to come out to other events, SFU Public Square, which has helped to sponsor the faculty lecture series, and we really love it when the community engages with us, because we learn from you as you learn from us. Having said that, I hope you have a, uh, a wonderful uh, break over the holiday seasons, and I hope you join us for a little reception after this lecture. And please join with me again in thanking Dr. Stephanie Simmons.